1980 Westfall Middle School and I was in the sixth grade and for the last 16 years I have opened every Mother's Day sermon with this story. Our teacher in the sixth grade, Mrs. Cook, was going to have a baby and so she was going to be gone for six weeks and we needed a substitute teacher at Westfall Middle School and they brought in none other than my mom to be the substitute teacher for six weeks. My mom had taken a leave of absence because her mom wasn't well, and so she was taking care of her, and that gave her some time. She said, well, I'll go in and help out Westfall Middle School sixth grade for six weeks, and so she came and taught. Now, my mom taught in a, in a different era. For those of you who are a little bit younger, my mom taught in a time when they did something called corporal punishment. <laughs> and um, that's when they used to beat children. They used to beat them the teachers would have a piece of wood in their desk. It's called a paddle, and it'd have a little handle on it. Sometimes it'd have some holes in it so it could fly through the air faster, I guess, or whatever it was. And they would take children out in the hallway. They'd separate their feet about shoulder length apart. They would lean forward, exposing the target area to the person, and they just beat them. They just beat them right in the hallway for, for any number of things. You could, you could get it. And so this is always fun for... Uh, younger folks to see. If you were ever paddled, if you were ever paddled, would you raise your hand nice and high so we can see? Look at that. Look at that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now, let me see. Just, I'm not surprised necessarily about the guys who got it. I'm sure you deserved it. I'm, and I'm not surprised you'd want to paddle them. I'm not, I'm not surprised about that. But the, the ladies, this always surprises me. Do this again. But if you were a girl paddled in school, raise your hand, raise your hand. Yeah, yes, I see you waving over there. You're a multiple offender. It's like revival broke out. Yes, yes. I, man, I don't, well, anyway, my mom was a big believer in uh, paddling students. She was, a, she was very good at it too. She paddled boys, she paddled girls, she paddled entire families that went through the school system. In fact, in her elementary school, I didn't tell this story in the, I don't know that I've told this story before, but you need to know. My mom, one of the times she, her room was like on the third floor or second floor, whatever school she was in. And so she would take the kids out in the hallway and she would have them hang on to the railing, bend over like this, so they could see over the railing. And when she would paddle them, she would uppercut to try to get them up off their feet a little bit as she would <laughs> just give them a little extra scare. <laughs> I had kids forever. It's, it's called like, okay, one more story. Well, I mean, these, the, you get these stories. The other services don't get these stories. You get these stories. Uh, you've earned it. Because about now, I mean, you know, you're not getting a seat, right? You're here knowing you, you might as well get out at three o'clock before any seats open up for lunch for mama. So, but there was um, uh, the Schwabal family, the Schwabal, the toughest family in our school, toughest family in our school. And uh, the boy Schwabal, girl Schwabal, all the Schwabals, they were all tough, all of them. My mom paddled every one of them. And so much, she, they had such respect for her that even little old me, when a Schwabal would come by, once they knew that I was, uh, they, and they still called her Mrs. Justice. And he said, they, they, that's Mrs. Justice's son. Let's leave him alone. How about that? I had, they didn't want to mess with Mrs. Justice. Anyway, so she comes in to teach and she wants to set a good tone right away. So she makes this huge homework assignment. And all my friends are like, I mean, what's going on, man? Your mom, this is, she's supposed to be a sub. Subs are supposed to be nice and, and easy and fun, but she's not any of those things. And so you need to do something about it. This big, huge first day homework assignment. I got home that night and my mom comes up to me and she felt good about herself for making such a big homework assignment. She said, Chris, you get your homework done? And I said, yep. Now that was only kind of a lie. I say kind of a lie because our teacher, Mrs. Cook, 
had a rule that you could skip a homework assignment every six weeks. You didn't even have to have a reason. You just skip it. So it really wasn't a lie so much because I had done as much of that homework assignment as I was going to do. Right? So I was done because I was never going to start because I wasn't going to do it. But I also wasn't going to tell mom about Mrs. Cook's rule. So the next day we get to class and, you know, she's like, all right, put your homework out on the desk. And so that's when you're supposed to do that. And she'd come by with a book, grade book and grade it. Well, of course, I didn't put anything out there. I didn't, didn't do the homework. And so she walks up to the, to the center desk on the front row because the person who sat in the center desk on the front row is the person who talked too much. And that's where I was. I was sitting right there on the center desk in the front row. And mom walks up to me and says, Christian, where's your homework? And I, everyone's looking. I'm like, I didn't do it. <laughs> she said, David Christian Justice. I made a homework assignment. Why didn't you do it? And I said, I didn't have to do it, Mom. <laughs> I'm a hero, right? They're going to write songs about me. I have just told her off right in front of everybody in sixth grade. She said, David Christian Justice, get up and get out in the hall. It's all right. I got truth on my side. I'll just tell her when I get out there. So I walk out. Of course, everyone's ooh, looking. I walk out in the hall. Other sixth grade classroom doors are open. Ooh, and and so I walk out there and I'm feeling really good about myself. She comes out with a paddle on her shoulder. Put your hands up against that wall. She didn't waste any time. Put your hands up against that wall. I said, whoa, 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 mom. Our real teacher, Mrs. Cook, has a rule that you can skip a homework assignment every six weeks. And you don't need a reason. I skipped this one. And now I'm ready to walk back in the conquering hero of sixth grade. My mom said, I asked you last night. If you did your homework, you said you did. You lied to me. And you embarrassed me in front of those students. Put your hands up against that wall. This was not going as I had intended. <laughs> well, by now, of course, the other sixth grade classes are there. They, they know what's going on. And there's all the looking to see what's, what's going on. And you were supposed to, you know, there's some etiquette to beating kids in the hallway. You're supposed to close the door from the other rooms. It's not supposed to be this public thrashing. You're supposed to, well, she didn't close any doors. So now everybody knows what's going on. All these other rooms, something's going on out there. And the other thing you're supposed to do, you're supposed to have a witness. You're supposed to have a, another teacher there, right? To like, you know, pull the teacher out. That's enough. That's enough. No more. But she didn't have that either. So now everyone's watching. There's no witness. I'm out there. Got my hands up against the wall. And I'm in, I mean, I'm in trouble. I need something to get out of this. So I wheel around and look at my mom and say, you can't paddle me. You don't have a witness. <laughs> she grabbed me by the collar, spun me back facing the wall, put my face up against the wall and leaned in and said, what are they going to do? Call your mother? <laughs> whoosh, whoosh. Yeah. Yeah. So kids, have respect for your parents. How did we make it out of that alive? How did we? No, we did pretty good, I think, maybe. Uh, so that's Happy Mother's Day to my mom. Uh, 16 years of sharing that story. She would like to have a rebuttal. She doesn't get one. Uh, won't have the opportunity. Uh, we're in the middle of a series in the book of Mark called, called The Heart of Man. And I, I'm, I'm not really getting out of it so much because we've got a great story here about the heart of a mother. But we're just going to have to jump up a few verses to get there. So we'll go back to where we left off. Uh, next week, we'll go back to where we were. We're not skipping anything, except we're going to jump ahead this week. because there's this, there's this story you've got to see here. And I'm, I'm titling it, The Inspiration of a Mother's Faith. The Inspiration of a Mother's Faith. It's in Mark chapter 7, verses 24 through 30. Mark 7, verses 24 through 30. Let's stand, okay? We'll honor the reading of God's Word. And as my kids had mentioned to you, I guess they gave the flowers away. Did you give the flowers away, Ty? Oh, yeah. We did? Good. Beck's not uh, well. She had a little setback this week. She had a procedure done on Tuesday, and, and we, it didn't uh, just, she's still struggling, bless her heart. And I hate it. I hate it for her. She can't be here today. Uh, but the kids gave out the flowers, and it went well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it went, it went well. Don't ask don't ask anyone. Okay. All right. Well, good. I'm sure it went well. <laughs> mom called me after the first service. <laughs> and mom said that Ty and Jake ran out of reasons to give flowers away and then said, all right, how about woman with the most husbands? <laughs> As, did you do that in the second service too? No. No, you didn't? Okay. This is their first time hearing it. 
That's okay. Good. Good, good, good. All right. Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 24. This is what the Bible says. Jesus got up. He went away from there to the region of Tyre. And when he had entered a house, he wanted no one to know of it, yet he couldn't escape notice. But after hearing him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Gentile of the uh, Syrophesian race. That means the, the Syrians and the Phoenicia, the Syrians had taken Phoenicia, and so then the Syrophoenicians came of that. They sort of had control over both. Either way, it wasn't, wasn't good from the Jews' perspective. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, let the children be satisfied first. It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, yes, Lord, but even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And Jesus said to her, because of this answer, go, the demon has gone out of your daughter. Going back to her home, she found the child lying on the bed, the demon having left. Let's pray. God, thank you for this truth and our time to look at and learn from your word. I pray that we would. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Let me give you some uh, catch up on, on how we got here. So the Galilean ministry is finished and, and Jesus is in the last year of his earthly ministry. And so what happens now is he takes his followers out of what would have been more Jewish dominated area and moves them to a place where, where Tyre and Sidon would not have been into that sort of religious thinking. And there would have been much pagan worship there. In fact, Baal worship was the primary worship. And so this is not a great area. You, don't, you won't see as many miracles in this part of the ministry of Christ. What you'll get is a lot more of the teaching to his followers. It's sort of moving them away from, they couldn't go anywhere in Galilee without this huge crush of people. So it moves them away from that area to really focus on them because as he is crucified and then, then rises from the dead and ascends into heaven, it's going to be up to these followers to take the gospel to out, uh, throughout the world. So he needs to get them away a little bit to spend more time ministering to them and preparing them. But of course, his fame is spread to the point that even he goes into the, the region of Tyre and Sidon and they still, they know who he is. And, and a woman knows who he is and she's got an issue and she wants to come talk to him. In verse 25, we meet this remarkable woman, a remarkable woman. There are three things I want you to see about this woman I think that we can apply to, to our lives as well. Here's the first, a determined petition a determined petition. So we see right away the daughter has an unclean spirit. This isn't unlike the things we saw in the Galilean ministry, that my daughter or my son or someone is dealing with an unclean spirit, please help. That's basically what happens here. She wants the Lord to cast out the demon. She falls at the feet of Jesus and makes her petition. The difference here, as you see in Mark, is it describes her, she's a Gentile. The Gentiles were considered dogs by the Jewish people. She's a Gentile. She's a woman. Culturally, that wouldn't have been accepted. Remember the woman who wanted to hear the, the, the issue of blood, wanted the healing from Jesus? She didn't think to stop and have the conversation. She just reached out and touched his cloak. So it's a Gentile and a woman and Syrophoenician. It's also bad because in, in Matthew's letter, he writes it as, that means she's a Canaanite. That was a cursed race. They were supposed to be exterminated. This cursed race, Gentile woman, Syrophoenician, is having a, wanting a conversation with Jesus. She's, the, she's from the wrong place. She's from the wrong race. She's from the wrong nationality. And she's the wrong gender. Yeah, you ever feel like you might be the wrong person for the faith? You ever think you might be the wrong person to, to go to Jesus and ask him to forgive you? I know there's some people think they've done so many bad things. They're just not a good fit. They're just the wrong person. And, and she would have, culturally speaking, would have been wrong in a lot of ways. But take heart, brothers and sisters, if you think you've done so many wrong things, you can't go to Jesus. It's not about how wrong you are, because we're all wrong. Everyone's sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's not about how wrong you are. It's about how right Jesus is. And she goes to Jesus in Matthew chapter 15, verse 22. This is how Matthew records it. This Canaanite woman from that region came up and began to cry out saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Now, she has heard of Jesus. 
She has responded to Jesus. This is sort of like the New Testament version of Rahab, who's in the walls of Jericho. She's taught all this pagan worship and pagan practices, and yet she has heard of a God who protects His people, and she wants to serve that God who protects His people. And of course, Rahab does just that. Well, now here we have this Syrophoenician woman. She has heard of Jesus, and she wants what Jesus can do. She knows enough about Him to call Him Lord. She knows enough about him to call him son of David. She recognizes his lordship and his messianic connection. He's the Messiah. He's the healer. He's the helper. Lord, son of David, help my daughter. It's remarkable. I don't, I don't know what her past would have been, but in that pagan area, maybe she tried some of the pagan worship. Maybe she was, she was certainly familiar with the pagan worship, but whatever it was and whatever her past was, that wasn't the answer. Jesus was. And even though she wouldn't have been seen as the kind of person who could do this, she saw him as the one who could help, and she went to him, and she made her petition before him. The interesting thing about this is if you're going to go pray for somebody else, that's great, and she needed help for her daughter, but before that, she petitioned God's son as who he was. If you're going to pray for somebody else, great, but you need to make sure that you are authentic in your prayers to the Father. You need to make sure that you're authentic in your prayers to Christ the Son. She knows who He is. You are the Lord. You are the Son of David. You are the Messiah. You are the one. Now that I've, now that I've expressed to you, I know who you are. I've petitioned you knowing who you are. In our, in our homeschool days, we homeschooled our kids for a while, especially the girls, mostly all the way through, the boys until they got to, to uh, high school. In our homeschool days, our curriculum, we had curriculum, but pretty much it was kind of the Bible. It was the Bible. And Becky thought very, very strongly that the Bible has logic, the Bible has region, or, or, or reason, the Bible has geography, the Bible has poetry, the Bible has truth. A, a big homeschool day for us was Awana here at at Lee Park, all, they'd, they'd have to memorize the verses. They'd have to memorize the Bible verses and then go stand in front of people and present the Bible verses. And man, that was a big day. Our kids got to go see other people and they got to go give their Awana verses. And so that was a big day for us. That was a, that was a homeschool class. Becky has continued that in her life with our kids. When our girls went off to college, they would call home. And I didn't hear exactly what they were saying, but I could hear what Becky was saying. Becky would say, have you read your Bible today? No, 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 stop. Have you read your Bible today? If you haven't read your Bible today, go read your Bible, then call me back. No, 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 go read your Bible first, and then we'll deal with those issues. And it's something she's practiced in her own life. She hasn't, again, hasn't been well, hasn't been sleeping well. I got up the other morning, and it was probably three, four in the morning, and there she was. She had her phone on, and she was looking at her phone, and she was reading something. I said, baby, I'm so sorry you can't sleep. What's, what, are you, what are you looking at? What do you, what do you read? She goes, oh, just the book of Matthew. Just, just got finished. I said, oh, okay, so what, what part did you read? And she said, oh, I read the whole thing. I said, now, you know, if you're going to read a gospel all the way through, you might want to start with Mark. It's pretty quick. She just read the entire book of Matthew while she was up and uncomfortable and unable to sleep. If, if that's the kind of woman who's going to pray for my kids, then I'm thankful for that. Because it's an authentic prayer of someone who is seeking after the Lord. She, she's seeking help for her daughter, but first we see she's seeking after the Lord. And we see that determined petition. The next thing we see is a desired position. So then the mother calls out to Jesus, and he doesn't answer. In Matthew's gospel, and if you want to turn, turn to Matthew chapter 15, you can follow along. We're going to go through this a little bit. In, in Matthew chapter 15, the disciples answer. You know what the disciples said? Not all, oh, this woman's trying to get your attention. No, the disciples say, why don't you send her away? She just won't stop talking. Send her away. She keeps shouting at us. She's not in a position. She's a Canaanite, Syrophoenician woman, Gentile, Canaanite. Don't talk to her. They don't, no, they get her out of here. Jesus doesn't say anything until he engages her in a conversation. And this is a remarkable conversation. Take a look. First, Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's true. That's true. It, because the Bible says in Romans chapter 16, first to the Jews and then to the Greeks. So that's true. And, and the message of salvation would come to the Jews, and then the Jews would be the light of salvation to the world. That's true. That's Isaiah 49. So he's telling her something that's factually true. I'm here. You're asking me a question, 
But I'm here to meet the needs of God's people first. That's the, that's the way it lays out. Seems like it might be a little distancing, but it's true. Look what the woman says in verse 25. And, and she came and bowed down before him saying, Lord, help me. She again assumes the position of worship and uses the language that recognizes his position and his lordship. Not offended, not offended by it. She recognizes, she knows he's the son of David. She recognizes enough of the process to still not be the least bit offended by what he has said to her. And then Jesus says this in verse 26. It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Not uncommon for Jews to refer to Gentiles as dogs. But here's a woman who recognizes who he is and, and is worshiping in her action and in her speech. And he says, it's not good for me to give what is meant for God's people to you because you're a dog. Why would he say that? It's interesting in the, in the Bible, in the, in the Greek language, there are a couple words for dog. There are a couple different words that are used for dog. And, and one of them is used for what would have been understood in that time in that culture, it didn't have a lot of domestication with, with animals and, and dogs, but and the, the bigger dogs and the, the just the, man, the big, ugly, nasty, all matted up, gross, like the junkyard dogs, the tough ones, they were sort of in the area and kind of outside the area. If there was a trash dump, the dogs would show up to try to get what they could eat. If they, maybe they'd slip around in and out of the towns and the villages or wherever. If there was something thrown, they might try to pick it up, and then they'd fight with each other, and people would shoo the dogs away. If, you're an old, if you like old westerns, you like to watch an old western, sometimes you'll hear a cowboy say to another cowboy, you cur. That cur is a, is a really nasty way to say, you're a dog. You're nothing but a dog, and the worst kind of dog you're a garbage eaten mutt dog that nobody wants around. Well, that would normally be the wording that would be used for the Gentiles, you dog. Jesus uses another word here for dog that refers to, look, maybe a good translation would be puppies that would have been domesticated, that would have been in the home. It's an interesting turn of phrase. Why would I take that which is meant for the children of God and give it to the puppies who would also be in the house. Interesting also, the woman caught it and look at her response. Yes, Lord. Not offended still. Yes, Lord. And even the puppies feed on the crumbs that fall from the master's table. You mean you're, you're saying I'm in the house? You're, you're, I'm not some dog out in the garbage heap? You're, you're saying that, that in my situation I would be considered in the home? Well, Lord, if I can just get close enough to you, I'll take the scraps. That'll be good enough. If I can just get a little bit of you. You're saying I have an opportunity for the scraps? I'll take it. I'll take it. I understand. I understand. To the Jews first. I understand. And now there is this dispensation that's happening. Dispensation means that God is allowed to adjust and alter the rules as he sees fit for his plans. What Christ is doing. This is coming to the Jews first. But you know what? Your faith has brought you into the house. You can benefit too. And the woman says, I'll take it. I'll take it. Here, here, are, the, here are the disciples. They're getting a lesson here. I mean, a firsthand lesson. What they want is the woman sent away. What they want is Jesus not to engage her in conversation. What they want is that Canaanite Syrophoenician woman out of there. Jesus engages her in a conversation she catches the conversation, catches, and she shows the disciples this desire for faith. And eventually they're going to be turned loose to take the gospel message to others outside the Jewish race. And what this woman does is, I mean, we all benefit now. We're not having to ask. We have open access to the Father through Christ the Son. And in this time, in this culture, she did not Christ brings her into the house because of her faith. And she says, I'll take it. I'll take whatever you can give me because a little bit of you is enough. Well, that leads to a defining proclamation. In verse 28 of Matthew's gospel, Jesus says this. 
This is this beautiful old woman. Your faith is great. He's only Jesus only said that twice. He only says that twice in his ministry that's referred to in the Bible. The, the other time he says that there's a Roman, there's a Roman official who's who's concerned about his paralyzed, his paralyzed servant. And the Roman centurion goes to the Lord Jesus. He's heartbroken about his servant's paralysis and he asks Jesus to help. And, and I'll, whatever, I know you can do it. And whatever you can do, if you speak it, if you can come over, if you whatever, just could you help? And Jesus says to the Roman centurion, your faith is great, your servant is healed. And now here is, here's this woman Wrong place, wrong race, wrong nationality, wrong gender. Oh, woman, your faith is great. It will be done as you wish. Your daughter is healed at once. She's passionate for her daughter, obviously. She knows Jesus is the only way. And given the opportunity that she might step back, no, the faith is not real. I, I just heard you were son of David. I don't really know what that means. No, no, I know you are the son of David. And I know that you have come for the Jewish people first. And I know that my position is not that there's a means to the end. I know that it's from the Jews. To, I, I, I will follow you no matter what, because you are who you say you are. Oh, woman, your faith is great. You had every reason to walk away. You had every reason to run away, and yet you kept pursuing. Your faith is great. Many times it is said of mothers that they, are a, they have a mama bear personality to them. And some of you have a mama bear in your home, and some of you, it's fun. Mama bears can be fun, unless you're on the wrong end of mama bear. But mama bears can be fun. But, but you know what, if, if a mama bear isn't focused on Christ and isn't focused on bringing her children to Christ, then it's just an angry woman, which can be terrifying enough. But if that mama bear is determined to get her kids to Christ, well, praise God for that. And God uses those prayers, and they avail much, a righteous mama praying for her babies. She went home. In Mark chapter 30, it says, when the mother went home, her child was lying in bed. The demon was gone. Maybe the first good night's rest that child had had in a long time. Mom comes home. Her baby's okay. I wish I could, I wish I could make us all have that faith, that kind of faith that Christ would look at us and say, your faith is great. And there'll be that day when, when we die, those of us who are saved by Christ would be able to hear that incredible phrase, well done, good and faithful servant, well done, enter in. But in the meantime, wouldn't it be great to know that he would be able to say of you, oh woman, oh man, oh young woman, oh young man, your faith is great. Stand with me, let's close in a word of prayer. I, I don't know how it'll work in heaven and when we'll get to meet people, how we'll get to meet people. I'm not sure exactly how that works because they're going to come way after the worship of Christ, which will be first and, and eternal. I'd like to meet this woman. I'd like to meet this woman. Everything that may have been set up for her to just step back and she persevered and she got to Jesus and he heard her prayer. Again, I, w I just wish I could implant that in you. I wish that today if you're standing and you're not, you're not sure about your relationship with Christ, you can be sure. And it's not because of what you haven't done right, but it's what He did. That's why you can have a right relationship with Him. My second, mother's, my second favorite Mother's Day story, I'll tell it quickly. I was early in preaching. I wasn't a pastor yet, but I was being invited around to places to preach. And I was invited to Mount Pleasant Baptist Church here in the county. And I preached, and I, 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 I opened the Bible, read the Bible, explained the Bible. I didn't know how to end it, and so I just ended it. I said, that, that's it. And don't sin anymore. All right, goodbye. See you later. I didn't know what to do. But they, they asked me back, and they asked me back on a Mother's Day. That's why it's my favorite, second favorite Mother's Day story. They asked me back on a Mother's Day, and I thought, now this time, 
I'm going to land that plane beautifully. So I got up and I did the message and I went through all that stuff. I got done. I got to the end. And I thought, man, if I don't get a response from them, it didn't work. It's not, a, you know, because then I was dumb enough to think that it, the success of the sermon was determined by the response of the altar. I thought that was it. So if you're a guest speaker, no one comes forward. Well, that's just like saying you're terrible. So I've got to get people to respond. So it's Mother's Day Sunday. I got up and preached my sermon. I got done with preaching the Mother's Day sermon. And then I said, now, I want you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, to look at that woman next to you, your mother. Maybe she's with you today. Maybe your mother's not able to be with you today. Maybe your mother has passed and she's, she's not here today. Maybe that's what happened. Well, now's the opportunity. During this time of invitation, if you love your mother, <laughs> come. <laughs> People were stepping over each other at the altar, you know, I love my mama. So that was terrible and clumsy and awful. I'm not going to do it again, ever. But, and here's the thing. You can where you are. I mean, if you want to come during this time and pray, praise God. That, there's something special about it. And you can pray right where you are. Maybe your mom is with you today. And maybe your mom is, you're just thankful for another Mother's Day with her. Maybe she's close enough to you to grab her by the hand. Maybe it's your wife. Maybe, maybe it's your wife. You're, you're just glad she's here to take her by the hand one more time. Praise God. I wish Mother my kids was here. They're special. Moms are special, man. They're special. And so, but maybe that's not your experience. Maybe your mom isn't here. Maybe your mom... You didn't have that. Maybe you didn't have that. Well, draw close to Jesus. If your mama is here, draw close to Jesus. If she's not, draw close to Jesus. Because he can provide a comfort and a strength and a hope. He can do that today. If you're not a follower of Christ, you can ask him. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus the Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. The thing every good godly mother wants you to have, but only Christ can give it. And so if that's your prayer today, you pray that prayer today. If, if you are a follower of Christ, but you want him to be able to say, great faith. Good, ask him to forgive you and ask him to help you so you can show and have and develop a great faith. God, thank you for the opportunity we have to respond. Thank you for motherhood. Lord, we, we live in a day when our girls are not protected. Our mothers are devalued. We live in a day when this, this godly ordained institution of motherhood is, is challenged. Oh, God, we need your help. That you might look at us and say, your faith is great. During this time of invitation, I, I pray that, God, we would respond in such a way as we call out to you, ask you to forgive us, to help us, to heal us, to make us whole. I'm confident that you can do things that I cannot do. You can touch lives I, in ways I cannot. You're the one the prayer should be directed to. You're the one the response should be directed to. And so now we ask that you do things only you can do with these, the people that you love so much that you sent your son for them. And we'll give you the praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.